actually uh, you would like to uh, welcome everybody here. And on behalf of the audience, I would like to welcome our speak our guests tonight. Uh, Dr. Panchuli, Samir Panchuli from Pennsylvania. He will give us a very interesting lecture. This will be the first lecture from Dr. Panchuli, but will not be the last. So we are looking forward to seeing him uh, more and more during this course. And I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Adil Barakat Riemi. Uh, we are very happy uh, to have uh, both of them uh, tonight. Uh, actually, uh, this is a photo taken in 1982, cardiology department. Uh, this is Professor uh, Ibrahim Taufi, Professor Ahmed Smail, Professor Mustafa Said. Myself is here. And if you would like me to enumerate, this is Annie Atiba, uh, this is Adel Alam, this is uh, Ashraf Reda, this is uh, Muhammad Salah, uh, this is late Sayyid Azab, this is Muhammad Farid Gindi, this is Fikri Deep, uh, this is Samah Alam, uh, Ali Al Amin, uh, Ali Samanudi, and Abu Bakr Tammam. If you notice, uh, Professor Mukhtar Gum'a was not in this photo. Uh, unfortunately, during these days, he was working in uh, United Arab Emirates, and uh, he, he was a very strong and good messenger for the Egyptian doctors uh, in United Arab Emirates. Uh, was in uh, starting the program of cardiology and he built up uh, uh, a school of medicine and the cardiology uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we lost uh, Professor Mukhtar a month ago. Uh, he died uh, last month, but when he came back from uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, he was a, a very strong professor of cardiology in our department. Uh, he, he was very energetic. Uh, he pushed the department forward. He had a very strong social and scientific relationship. Actually, we have learned it from Professor Mukhtar a lot. And uh, he was the, the head of the department, then the dean of medicine, in Al-Azhar University. Uh, he was a member of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology, and he shared in probably every program for uh, cardiology in Egypt, uh, starting from uh, the fellowship of uh, uh, cardiology in the Egyptian board. And I was lucky to initiate the program of uh, fellowship in cardiology uh, with Professor Mukhtar and other colleagues. Uh, we lost him, but we never, we will never lose the, his advice and his uh, behavior with us, and uh, we have to pray for him. Uh, every time we will spend a few minutes to remind our services, our professors uh, who, who died and who are uh, with us. And this is very important for us actually to remember uh, these great people uh, during our uh, uh, previous days. Uh, tonight, uh, the course of uh, the radio course we are running now uh, is the, going around this magic machine in the magic room and the program of the radial, al Azhar radial course we are uh, initiating today, uh, the aim will be how to delineate the anatomy uh, of the coronary arteries and how to uh, get a wealth of information uh, about the coronary circulation, coronary arterial circulation to diagnose the diseases, so as the sensitivity to treat the disease and so on. This is our program, but as we mentioned before, during in, inside this room, you can do a lot regarding the valve, 
return the electrical activity of the heart, uh, structural heart disease, diagnosis and treat, congenital heart disease diagnosis and treatment, electrical uh, diagnosis and treatment. But because we are interested in this course in coronary angiography and PCI, so a wealth of information we can get in, about the coronary restoration uh, in this room. Uh, actually, when I remember my uh, first days, we uh, were starting with arteriotomy. Then uh, days comes and the knowledge improved and we got Jodkin's percutaneous approach uh, to puncture the femoral artery percutaneously and it was proved to be safe. Now uh, we have moved to the arm and from the radial artery to the ulnar artery to the distal artery in the snuff box, uh, right or left hand, right or left arm, leg or arm, uh, it differs. And uh, one size does not fit all. So we cannot perform all cases from the radial and we cannot perform all cases from femoral. Each one and each axis has its own indication in certain situations according to uh, the patient's uh, condition. This is what we are going to learn from the very basic how to uh, just put your local anesthesia in the arm till the very advanced uh, complicated uh, PCI procedures and uh, primary PCI uh, from the radial uh, approach. Uh, our program today, we will have the first pic uh, uh, lecture from Professor uh, Panchuli and then the second uh, lecture from Mansour. Uh, I myself will help Professor Adil Riemi uh, to, uh, to share uh, this program today. Uh, and for you all, Professor Adil uh, Barakat Riemi was graduated from the medical school, room, school from Sultan Qaboos University. Uh, he did internal medicine, general cardiology, and interventional cardiology in Canada. Then he came back to Oman in uh, uh, 29. He worked primarily a radial uh, interventionalist and intervention cardiology uh, through the radial. He initiated the program in Oman and uh, runs a lot of courses and uh, he taught a lot of people uh, through these courses in the radial approach. Uh, he is interested also in uh, CTO intervention, uh, TAV, and the cardiac cath uh, management. Uh, you are very welcome, Professor Adil. I leave you to introduce Professor Panchuli, and we are uh, hoping to enjoy our tonight meeting. And you are very welcome. All. Thank you very much. Uh, stop share. Stop share. Okay, uh, Professor Radil, you can uh, introduce uh, Professor Panchuli. Sure. Uh, thank you for your kind words, uh, Prof. Alam. Uh, I think credit uh, needs to be uh, where credit is due. Uh, the radial program was actually started by uh, Professor Mansour in Amman. I came and I just joined the, the wagon. Uh, so uh, the credit goes to uh, Dr. Mansour. Uh, I'm happy to uh, present uh, Dr. Samir uh, Panchodi, well-known interventional cardiologist. Uh, he did his uh, undergraduate uh, in Ahmedabad in India, but then moved to the States. Um, he did his medical school in New York, and he did his interventional cardiology in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and um, has lots of publications. Um, many of them are uh, very... Um, in the very heart of what we're discussing today. And I, I just noticed in the uh, CV that his latest, uh, his latest paper is the comparison of door to balloon time for primary PCI. I would like to hear more about that. Uh, 
I know it's been accepted. He has lots of publications. He runs uh, radial courses. Uh, I, I actually just, uh, I, I opened YouTube. I wrote your name, uh, Professor uh, Pancholi, and I saw the, the trico, but uh, Transradial Interventional Program multiple times. Uh, so I think he's the right person uh, with uh, Prof Mansour to guide us through uh, this new technology uh, that has become mainstay now. Uh, Prof uh, Pancholi, please. You'll need to unmute. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, are you able to hear me clearly on your end? Yeah, it's very clear. Yes. Okay, good. So let me share my screen. So, you know, um, I'm excited that we have a transradial program, uh, you know, that is uh, going to have multiple sessions. And uh, I'm so excited that the radial adoption, um, just one second. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. So I was asked this afternoon, this evening, to uh, uh, present a case of a complication of transradial access. Uh, I have actually shown this at previous uh, programs, although this is a different case. And so let me share my screen here. Um, just one second. Okay. Uh, the transradial access does not have many complications, which is one of the big reasons why uh, transradial access is uh, becoming more and more popular worldwide. So I'm going to show you one where one should worry about a radial access related complication. My very few disclosures. Um, so let's talk about a patient here. 56 year old female with a N STEMI uh, with a troponin T of 250. With chest pain uh, and found to think there is a technical issue with the Dr. Samir. Uh, probably we, we lost the connection. Communication is Okay. How about? Okay. Are you able to see the screen and hear me again? Yeah, it's clear. Okay. Very. Sorry about that. Uh, internet, you know, related interruption there. So, this patient with a and and. Uh, Second. Okay, uh, we we took a five French right radial access using the anterior puncture technique. A first stick by our fellow uh, gave the usual vasodilator and anticoagulation cocktail. In our lab, we use verapamil two point five milligrams, uh, nitroglycerin two hundred micrograms, and uh, fifty units per kilogram of heparin. So that's what was administered. Uh, Heparin is usually given intravenously, and the rest of the vasodilators are given intraarterially. Uh, after which, a 0.035 inch long J tipped guide wire was advanced, and a 5 French Tiger catheter uh, was placed in the ascending aorta. Uh, the patient had a very transient bout of pain while we were advancing the guide wire. Very short, one second of an ouch and then it resolved and uh, there was no further pain. The remainder of the procedure was uneventful. We did an ad hoc left circumflex uh, drug eluting stent implantation. Uh, the total procedure time from door to door was 45 minutes. Uh, a TR band was put on the puncture site and the patient was doing very well. Uh, the patient went to the recovery room and was uh, uh, fine initially, and then 
complained of mild forearm pain, very little pain in the forearm. The nurse evaluated the forearm and found that the forearm felt very firm and that there was a mild prominence compared to the other side. Uh, the doctor, the cardiology fellow was consulted uh, or asked to come in and uh, looked at the arm and you know, ordered an analgesic. The nurse had already tightened up the TR band with more air, uh, but then the, the patient's pain continued. The, the arm was now unequivocally more swollen than what it was half an hour ago. The fellow again was asked to see the patient and uh, forearm pain. So let's talk a little bit about forearm pain after cardiac catheterization from transradial access. Forearm pain is one of the few uh, occurrences after radial access which should be taken very, very seriously. It almost never occurs without a underlying problem which could turn into a major complication. So the first thing to do when you have forearm pain, if you're in the procedure, is stop the procedure and evaluate the reason for forearm pain. Uh, and again, if you are doing the procedure and the pain occurs, then the first thing to do is to do a low pressure radial artery angiogram under fluoroscopy. You do not need to use cine angiography, so you save some radiation, and use a 50-50 contrast mix and do a low pressure angiogram, and that'll be immediately able to delineate the etiology. Obviously, in this patient, this was not available because the patient was already in the recovery room. But this video that you're seeing right now is from a different patient where, again, the patient experienced forearm pain after advancement of the guide wire. The guide wire was quickly removed by the operator, and then they did an angiogram appropriately and found, as you can see, right at the uh, proximal radial artery, there is contrast uh, extravasation. The radial architecture is still fairly preserved, but there's dye leaking out of the radial. And this is the most common mechanism of radial artery perforation, uh, which is one of the most common reason for forearm hematomas. So uh, the reason we get this problem is because we have to use a J-tipped guide wire to prevent uh, inadvertent you know, uh, entry into the side branches. And when we advance this three millimeter tip, J-tipped guide wire in a less than three millimeter lumen, the guide wire tip has a habit of engaging or entering very small muscular branches. And sometimes if they are geometrically aligned, they get favored and the wire goes into these branches. So I have drawn a little cartoon here to kind of show you what happens. The red tubular structure is the radial artery. And as you can see, the small muscular branches usually arising at an obtuse angle from the vessel. And when the wire, which is three millimeter J and the artery is two millimeters diameter, the wire is straightened out. And the tip basically engages one of the muscular branches, pokes it like a needle. And then sometimes it prolapses and you advance it further and you don't even realize that you did this. And you go forward with the wire and you put a catheter. And this probably happens more frequently than we realize. But majority of the time, there is no extravasation. But in this instance, obviously, there was some extravasation. Uh, even extravasations are frequently contained. And we do the case and we uh, spontaneously get a sealing off of this uh, perforation and we don't realize it. But you know, obviously, if it progresses, we get a forearm hematoma with forearm pain because blood is a very um, inflammatory type of a material for this for the extravascular space and so you get pain there so so again the mechanism is this j tipped wire engaging the the muscular branch and subsequently causing bleeding there which can do that so so as we saw in the previous angiogram, and I'll pl you know, pl pl play this again, that's what happened in, in this area. The wire came and poked one of the side branches and it started to leak. Now, if this happens during the case, then we, we can easily go ahead and, uh, uh, if the lumen is accessible and your guide wire is across that segment, the best treatment for this problem is to advance a catheter and leave it there for a dwell time of 20 minutes or so 
uh, and allow that area to not have any active blood flow, which will majority of the time seal off the extravasation and you will get complete uh, sealing of the perforation, which will then be taken care of. So that's what was done in that previous case that we're seeing here, the guy across. And if you notice up there, that's where the perforation was. There is a little bit of spasm in the lumen, but the perforation radial artery is open and picked there. So if you have access to the radial artery lumen, and if you can get wire access to the proximal segments, advance a guide catheter or a diagnostic catheter across the perforated area and leave it there for a minimum of 15, probably 20, 30 minutes, and it will give you sealing of the area. Now, you can continue to do your intervention. You do not have to reverse anticoagulation in order to achieve this type of a sealing of the perforation. And so what we do in our lab is if we have a side branch perforation like this, we will go ahead and so it is removed and the patient is sitting in the holding room and you get called for a hematoma of the forearm as you can see here. Well, our nurses have a very good habit of marking the hematoma, which really doesn't improve anything. It just gives you an idea down the road. Uh, but the first and the foremost thing is to make sure that you're dealing with a real situation. So look at the contralateral arm, see the prominence of the muscles in the forearm, and compare it to your arm that is involved here in the access site complication. If you put them side by side, you can easily see that this area of the forearm here is significantly larger both in diameter and prominence compared to the contralateral side. Uh, and so this patient is developing an expanding forearm hematoma. This is one of the few radial artery complications which is a true emergency. This needs to be acted upon very promptly and this needs to be intervened upon. So if, if it is ignored, if you try to figure out or order a test or a consultation from vascular surgery or something that is not immediately available, even if it's ignored for a relatively short duration, this becomes a very large problem. And this forearm that you're seeing in the current slide is a catastrophic complication of compartment syndrome caused by an expanding, rapidly growing forearm hematoma. Uh, obviously, it's not the same patient. This patient actually presented from home with this problem uh, after radial access uh, a week ago. Uh, that's a whole different situation. But if you see the forearm <laughs> looking like it does, intervene upon it right away. Otherwise, this will be what you'll be faced with, and then you will have to, it'll become a surgical emergency. So how do you manage a forearm hematoma? Well, rapid assessment contralateral comparison. Uh, and one thing to realize is that the forearm hematoma is almost never caused by the radial artery puncture site. So tightening up your band or applying more pressure at the site is completely futile and does not have any effect on growth of this hematoma. So applying more pressure at the puncture site and walking away will not give you any relief, and it'll actually prolong the duration and you get more complicated. So the first and the foremost thing to do is to apply pressure along the course of the radial artery, direct pressure along the course of the radial artery. And I will go back a few slides and show you the arm. And so you want to press right along the presumed course of the radial artery. Uh, once you do that, you contain that little extravasation that you have. So apply pressure by whatever mechanism is available to you. You can use a elasto, you know, elastoplast bandage with uh, gauze underneath it, which is what this operator did uh, in, in, in here. And, uh, or you can apply direct pressure. The other important thing is to evaluate and monitor the distal digital sensation and perfusion. Because the forearm is a closed compartment, and when the pressure increases in the forearm, the distal digits here, the fingers, will become numb because of nerve compression, and they might even become ischemic because of bilateral arterial 
compression. So very important to keep an eye on this. What we do in our lab, because we don't want to compress the entire forearm because of the risk of ischemia and nerve uh, compression, we apply focused pressure along the radial uh, you know, artery itself by using this cylindrical tubular uh, you know, barrel of a 10cc syringe along with a band here that you see. So we put this uh, zip tie type band on the 10cc syringe barrel at the presumed site of the perforation, continue to obviously compress the radial artery puncture so that there's no bleeding going on. Uh, and this leads to sealing uh, for, and then you can monitor the distal perfusion by your plethysmographic sensor and assess the uh, sensation in the fingertips to make sure you're not causing nerve damage and a lot of ischemia while doing this. Uh, one of the problems, if this is unattended, is the occurrence of the compartment syndrome. And the reason being, the forearm interosseous compartment is a closed space. It does not have a lot of uh, wiggle room in there. So when you start to get expansion of the volume of the contents on this compartment, you will rapidly see an increase in the pressure. And the pressure is transmitted in the vital structures there, which is the median nerve and the ulnar nerve, and if those two get contract, uh, the, if those two get mechanically pressurized, you will get permanent nerve damage with Volkmann's contracture, et cetera, which is a very difficult uh, long-term consequence with loss of functionality of the upper extremity. It should never reach to that point, so if you're not able to contain this hematoma by pressure, then you obviously have to ask the help of your vascular surgical colleagues who will then have to do a fasciotomy which looks very grotesque and very uh, difficult uh, to justify to the patient and the family uh, down the road because the whole reason to do the radial access was to prevent a vascular complication. Uh, the blood in the intercos the, the blood in the interosseous space is very inflammatory. So the skeletal muscle be uh, bellies become very, very inflamed by the exposure to the blood contents. And that is why even after removal of the hematoma, you should, the vascular surgeon will not completely close up the forearm. They will leave it open sometimes for a few days to allow these m muscular bellies to reacquire their original shape so that the, the volume goes down. So a very catastrophic complication if you get a compartment syndrome. Uh, and one should never reach to that point in this day and age because if you respond to the forearm uh, pain, very early on and compress along the radial artery line, you will never have this complication that you'll have to deal with. So I will stop here and take any questions from the audience, from the attendees and the panelists, any comments or anything you have, please. Uh, actually, and what we understand now uh, is uh, <clears throat> re, uh, hematomas is not related to the puncture site, but it is usually perforation from male manipulation of the wire. So uh, would you advise uh, to get angiography of the radial artery once we find any resistance uh, in the passage of uh, the guide wire? Absolutely. So that's a very, very important point for not just the beginners, but for anybody. There is no stage in the learning of radial access where that axiom is not uh, important. Uh, so, you know, as you, as Dr. Alam said, uh, you know, one should always perform a low pressure angiogram of the radial artery if you have any tactile resistance to the passage of a guide wire. Switching to a better guide wire, a hydrophilic wire, or a, a 14 thousandths wire is not a good option. The first thing should be delineate the mechanism of resistance, and that way you can choose the right tool to get through that resistance without causing any damage. We, we have a question here. Uh, in case of perforation, how long should we compress along the radial artery to prevent a hematoma? So that's a very important 
question. And you know, when we started initially experiencing these type of complications, our logic-based decision-making was making us do compression for five minutes or maybe 10 minutes because we thought if the activated clotting time is 300 seconds, then the blood should clot if we double that. And so, you know, we used to press for 10 minutes or so, and we never really got proper hemostasis. Uh, well, we continued the compression and learned that if we prolonged, if we have a more prolonged compression time, then we get be, you know much better chances of success. So I would advise a minimum of 20 minutes of compression if you get a forearm pain with perforation, or especially if you get a hematoma. If you get a, a hematoma outside the cath lab, then you should compress for longer, maybe an hour or two hours, because the what? compression uh, pressure is not transmitted very well because of the hematoma itself. So very, very important to do prolonged compression. And if you're pressing along the radial artery, you will not get uh, any complication because of the pressure. Uh, we understand, uh, Professor Pancholi, that expanding hematoma will compress both the radial and the ulnar arteries, and the arm uh, will undergo ischemia and we may lose the arm. That's why we have to uh, solve the problem as quickly as possible. Uh, I have a question here uh, from one of the audience. In case of, of expanding forearm hematoma with compartment syndrome after sheath removal, is it feasible to recannulate the radial artery to see what is happening and sealing the perforation? Absolutely. I think, you know, if you have radial hemostasis already and you can repuncture the radial artery, uh, then that, because, you know, having the lumen access with the guide wire and placing a catheter in a perforated segment uh, with <clears throat> internal tamponade is one of the best ways to achieve hemostasis. So I don't think that's such a bad idea. Now, one can, you know, easily argue and say, well, you've already created a second problem because you are puncturing the, uh, you know, radial artery again. So if you can manage with extrinsic compression without causing digital ischemia or, or nerve sensation, you know, uh, uh, problems or, you know, those type of issues, then I would manage them outside the lab. But if you have any difficulty and you are able to recannulate the radial artery, I would go back and uh, try to go distal, puncture it, get up again, and see what's going on, and then deal with it. Uh, but I think uh, if you repuncture the radial artery, you have to be very cautious this way, because uh, if the wire goes to the perforation again, uh, or perforates another vessel, or another muscular branch of the radial artery, uh, this will cause another size of problem. So uh, uh, we have to be very cautious in manipulating uh, this area again. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think you know that's a very important point is that going back in should be used as the final option where you don't have good hemostasis by external compression and you're trying to figure out what the mechanism of your failure of management is. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ivan? Uh, they, there is a question uh, here about using Doppler, but I'll actually be more basic than that. Um, in your lab, do you do Allen test at all? So we do not do Allen's test to decide if we should go radial or not, but uh, we do a reverse Barbeau test before the procedure because we monitor the, the patient's radial artery flow after the procedure to make sure we don't get occlusion. So we, we don't use the Allen's test to, you know, like, like we used to use more than 10 years ago, where if we had a bad Allen's test, we would not go radial. We would go to the opposite side or go femoral. We don't do that anymore. We are using the reverse Barbeau test now to monitor the radial artery post-procedurally. Okay. Professor Pancholi, in your first words, you said, uh, anterior puncture, yes. the word anterior puncture. Uh, would you clarify to the audience what do you mean by anterior puncture? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, uh, to cannulate the radial artery, we have two options. Uh, you know, historically, when percutaneous arterial access was being developed uh, by the radiologists, uh, they used to go through and through the radial or any other artery. They will uh, puncture the anterior wall and then go and through the lumen and puncture the posterior wall. And that is what we still do with the radial artery because it's very feasible and very safe. Now, anterior puncture means you do not puncture the posterior wall of the radial artery. You go in the radial artery through the anterior wall, you get in the lumen, you get blood flow, and you are able to pass a guide wire right from that point. So those are the two, two slightly different ways of obtaining radial lumen access with a punctured needle. Does it differ if you are using a metal needle or a, a cannula with a plastic part? Very good points. So, you know, uh, the, both of those could be used to obtain either anterior puncture access or, you know, through and through uh, access. Uh, there is no real difference between the two of them, although in my lab we use the plastic uh, cannula with the angiocath types, uh, you know, 20 gauge cannula to, to do counter puncture access. We typically don't aim for anterior puncture access. If I have to do anterior puncture access, I personally prefer using the metallic needle for that uh, because the uh, ability to advance the guide wire with an open-ended metallic needle is more promptly available. That's good. Uh, there are a couple of questions here uh, asking about using the the J tip being uh, very small, like 1.5, do you think that will have any uh, impact? I think so, because you know, mechanistically, the reason this happens is because as we come out of the of the uh, you know of the needle or the or the uh, cannula, you know, or the sheath, uh, we are having a three millimeter diameter J wire which is straightened out and it you know, does not get the opportunity to make a full J, it becomes almost like a L, and so it pokes into the branch. So if you have a shorter diameter J, and you come out into a less, uh, in, a, in a larger lumen, then the J will have a chance to form. So I think a, a 1.5 millimeter J is a solution to this problem, mm -hmm. and uh, if you have access to that, that will be a good frontline wire to use. The, the only problem from my experience is that uh, you can easily straighten the three millimeter J to insert it, while the 1.5, you have to use that uh, plastic straightener that comes with it. So Excellent it's, point. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very important point is that, you know, because the 1.5 millimeter J does not have a core wire, you cannot straighten it out by stretching on it. So, you know, in the practical sense, it's a little bit more cumbersome, but... Um, you know, if you have a, if you have a, a problem uh, that you uh, feel like this is a very small radial artery and it's an unusually small radial artery, then an upfront use of a 1.5 millimeter J, besides being a little bit more, you know, annoying, is is not a real problem. It 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 might even help, I think. For Falam, there is a question from uh, one of the audience. If we found an arm hematoma that started above the level of the cubital fossa, how could you, we manage it? So that actually becomes a more difficult problem uh, for yeah. the simple reason that now you're dealing with the brachial <clears throat> artery, which yeah. is an end artery. So if you go <clears throat> the brachial artery, then you will have global ischemia of the forearm and the hand. Uh, and the brachial artery is a much larger diameter vessel, so to control it is also very difficult, especially endoluminally. So I think, you know, if you have an upper arm hematoma, that should be a multidisciplinary type of an approach, Im you know, immediately where you probably have a perforation. The most common reason for an, a hematoma above the uh, elbow is you are going up through a high bifurcation radial artery without realizing, and you used very, uh, you know, a harsh force, and you have basically avulsed the high takeoff radial artery from the brachial artery. 
I have seen one or two cases of it uh, from my colleagues. Uh, fortunately, I still follow every single step that I was taught 15, 17 years ago, and uh, we haven't run into that problem ourselves. But I've, I've seen cases where people have sheared off the high takeoff radial artery with a big upper arm hematoma. That's a big problem. That should be attended by a surgeon uh, with you and or somebody who is very good at doing peripheral intervention. So do you agree with the classification of the hematomas, forearm hematomas, according to the size uh, from grade one to four and grade three, grade three, which is just below the elbow or grade four, which is just above the elbow. This means uh, an emergency surgical uh, situation. You have to call the surgeon for it. Absolutely. I think, you know, if you have an easy grade four hematoma, then yes. you should ask for another colleague who has vascular uh, you know, expertise, you know, either endovascular or surgical, because that mechanism is not going to be a muscular forearm, small branch type of a leak. It's going to be a, a laceration uh, or something more complicated, and it should be dealt with by uh, by somebody who can do both open as well as endovascular approaches. That's good. Adi? think there's uh, this, any role of ultrasound guided compression. It's ultrasound guided compression is actually good if you have a pseudoaneurysm type sac that you can identify with a neck. But the problem with fresh bleeding is the ultrasound is not very good at detecting it, especially if the velocity of the bleed is very low, like we see with the muscular branch. So with ultrasound, you'll see a hematoma, but it's very hard to see the actual rent in the radial artery branch. Uh, and so even if you do ultrasound, you're not going to be able to find where the leak is. If you have lumen access, then you can identify the location by doing an angiogram. But if you don't have lumen access, then I would compress all along the line of the radial artery, non-specifically because there's no way to be sure where the puncture site is. Mm -hmm. uh, do you use, routinely use... Uh... A verapamil, uh, nitroglycerin, and heparin during initiation of the radial approach? Yes, we always give a vasodilator cocktail. The only patient who is an exception to the vasodilators is patients with very, very severe aortic stenosis who are borderline hypotensive. Their systolic mm. blood pressure is less than 100, in which case we don't use the vasodilators and we use a very, very fast procedure time to get in and out to do a coronary angiogram from the radial artery in those patients. Now, anticoagulation, we always use from the radial artery because otherwise the radial artery occlusion rates are ex exquisitely high, very high, 70 plus percent. In this situation, if hematoma occur, do you aim at reversing the heparin effect? No, we actually, if, if we still have lumen access, we continue anticoagulation and even do intervention without any trouble. If we have no lumen access, we still don't give any protamine or any reversal for the systemic anticoagulation state. Uh, if the activated clotting time was very high, we would maintain the compression for a longer time. And that's basically all we change based on the anticoagulation. Okay, thank you. Adi? Um, uh, Prof. Alam, I'm not sure, uh, Prof. Mansour uh, is going to, because many of the questions I think might be answered by, uh, by Prof. Mansour's uh, case. Will be inshallah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Professor so, Panchuli, uh, uh, have you finished your talk? Yes, sir. We are all done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, it was very interesting. We enjoyed it too much and we are looking forward to seeing you more and more in uh, our uh, regular meetings, inshallah. Thank you uh, very much. I'm, I'm truly honored and thanks again for inviting. And if I could do anything else, please let me know and I will be there. Thank you. We'll keep in touch. Prof, Thank yeah, you very Prof, much. Prof Mansour is going to uh, present a case. I think uh, I think it will complete the picture of, of management of perforation, I believe. Okay, Prof. Uh, okay. left already? Uh, 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حاضر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل رب زدني علما طيب uh, your pictures ممكن my colleagues it would I would like to express my joy and pleasure to start the first session of Al Azhar Radio Report. At the beginning, I would like to welcome and acknowledge Dr. Banshoi for his agreement to join us. I wish his precious time permits for joining us in the next sessions, inshallah. The radial course, again, is a dedicated course that serves junior interventional cardiologists, helping them to start their radial program. Also, it outfits senior colleagues, helping them to master the radial approach. For those who didn't attend uh, the previous two sessions, uh, there are many specific objectives from this uh, course. It includes, but not limited to, patient care from preparation to discharge, how to set, set up your cath lab, normal and variant vascular anatomy from the digital arches to chronos, certainly the technique itself, uh, types of punctures okay, will be highlighted. Prevention, recognition, and management of complications will be, inshallah, will be uh, discussed in this course. Just to recap, based on the latest European set of cardiology guidelines 2018, radial approach became class 1A recommendation for any interventional cardiologist. In the uh, previous two sessions, we deliberated normal vascular anatomy of the radial, as well as ulnar artery. Moreover, Superficial and deep balmar arches have been highlighted, including the digital arches themselves. Uh, based on uh, publication of our group in a consecutive 1,000 patient, we identified high radial takeoff was the commonest variant anatomy. Uh, high takeoff uh, uh, anatomy, as mentioned by Dr. Banshul right now, usually induces very long spasm, and this spasm usually doesn't respond to extra doses of vasodilatric oxygen. So when the uh, high takeoff associated with uh, tortuosity, I think it adds insult to the injury itself. And sometimes, exactly as Dr. Banchola mentioned right now, it may be predisposed to perforation. And if it happens in this area, you will find the hematoma. And this hematoma usually induced by the high takeoff radial artery. It is not a brachial uh, hematoma. Also, we highlighted, described in details how to straighten the radial loop. We presented as well a rare case of radial hypoplasia and early termination, and what is the value of this early termination uh, to the interventional cardiology or the uh, radial approach. Also, we highlighted or presented uh, one case of very rare CTO of the brachial artery, and in the same patient was very tight region. How did we cross and how did it treat? We discussed last time. And I think this is the case of brachial concertina didn't mention in literature before. I will publish inshallah soon. Uh, I think we counted many purely in the previous sessions. The first one is don't push against the resistance. Don't push against the resistance it represents the fundamental basics of any intervention. Second tip, and we interpreted for that, please don't puncture at the styloid process, at least one to two centimeters. As you see here, there is a small superficial bulma artery. Sometimes you feel it. If you puncture, I think you will not get the right ulnar and you will cross. Exactly as uh, Dr. Banchuli mentioned right now, uh, Allen's test became the test from the past due to extensive radial and ulnar interconnection, usually no hand ischemia happens. Uh, today, I'm supposed to continue discussing the normal and variant vascular anatomy of the subclavian and unnominate arteries. But because of, we are privileged by Dr. Banshuli's presentation about management of radial hematoma, I did refer to adapt my presentation to his presentation. So, recognition and management of complications dedicated to the radial intervention. During my clinical career, I confronted with 10 dissimilar complications related to transradial intervention. Insha'Allah, will be discussed in details in the uh, complication course or complication sessions, insha'Allah. Dr. Banshuli highlighted nicely right now the hematoma and how to handle. This is the commonest complication of transradial intervention. And right now, I will jump to the most serious complication of the transradial intervention, which is radial perforation. Uh, but before, I would like to highlight 
the uh, management of renal artery perforation before 2011 and after 2011. The first was first or reported in the literature, external comparison by cuff, as Dr. Banchuli mentioned right now, sometimes we may be urged to reverse heparin by butamine sulfate. If failed, placement of the catheter across the radial artery perforation acts as a hemostatic device that seals the perforation. And there were few literature or few publications about rule of balloon tamponading in radial artery perforation. This was, was all written in the literature. If failed, uh, surgical fasciotomy was the last resort. So I would like to present my case right now. I will present four cases. The first and second cases treated as their available literature review. Uh, third case, the available instruments failed to seal radial artery perforation, so a novel device applied, the perforation seal. Already I published this, we published, and many of our colleagues published a similar outcome later on based on this publication. The fourth case I will discuss right now, but I will discuss cautiously and I will interpret it for that. Okay, let me start with the first case. First case was uh, Mr. Harry, 69 Canadian guy, hypertensive, not diabetic, uh, presented with high risk criteria of acute syndrome, non segment elevation, myocardial infarction. Angiography plus or minus, and uh, our default approach uh, was the uh, right radial approach. So, we identified high risk or high grade uh, OM uh, lesion with tight mid segment to myocardial bridge. RCA was free of significant disease. Type mid-segment to the cardiac bridge, and this almost uh, I mean, is a total occlusion of the OM branch. So uh, while we are preparing for BCI to AM, the patient complained of forearm pain, and we noticed the swelling of the forearm. And geography proved the evidence of ugly perforation, as you see. Okay, it's ill-defined in uh, actual, actual fact. Immediately closed by BC, BCA wire. And over this wire, we advanced the gate catheter, BCI to OM dive. We hope that this uh, gate catheter will act as a hemostatic device, and it did. Fortunately, the perforation completely sealed. The patient did very well. Duplex scan broke the evidence of no active bleeding with minimal interstitial hematoma. The patient discharged well, and no evidence of hand skin. So how did we treat? Mr. Harry, radial artery perforation. Remember, radial artery perforation was after diagnostic angle. Despite that, we continued for the BCI. We crossed the radial artery perforation by a BCA wire, and we completed the BCI. The Unfractionated heparin, not neutralized. Already we sealed and reconstructed the vessel. Uh, final angiogram must be followed by close observation of at least four hours for re-bleed. Dogexis can, I think, add information about the arm hematoma or extra position. Second case, uh, Ms. Fatma, 61, Omani lady, short, um, morbidly obese patient, uh, not hypertensive or diabetic, referred from a secondary hospital with acute care syndrome and stable angina. In actual fact, her ECG was uh, very yeah, it's suggestive of either severe ischemic heart disease, deep symmetric, asymmetric T wave inversion. In differential diagnosis, I asked my uh, registrar during that time, uh, what is differential diagnosis? So she told me it may be ischemic heart disease. I do agree about that. Maybe Hocum, yes, it may be. It may be intracranial hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, it may be, but the patient's uh, clinical uh, picture doesn't fit for the uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Anyhow, we started the uh, radial approach and we felt uh, resistance and the patient felt pain and injection exactly as Dr. Samir uh, explained. This is a hematoma most likely induced by the guide wire. So what to do? Again, we didn't start it. Shall we postpone the patient is having a chest pain with horrible ECG changes? No. Uh, we crossed by a bit CA wire and we did uh, coronary angiography. RCA was free of significant disease. LE showed evidence of non-significant lesion in the mid-segment. So what could be the underlying etiology of her chest pain and such uh, significant ECG, ECG chains? We did uh, left ventriculography, RAO and 
LEO. What is this? This is the characteristic state like appearance, highly suggestive of hokum and echocardiography after that proved the evidence of ischemic disease. As I mentioned, this patient came in emergency cases. So echocardiography was not done before. Uh, unfortunately, uh, bleeding persisted after the diagnostic end. We did expect that it will seal like Mr. Harry case, but uh, the GR diagnostic factor reintroduced and they placed approximately of, for the perforated segment. Again, perforation persisted for three times. We spent approximately one hour to seal by this way. Unfortunately, it didn't seal. So the last hour, the, another issue or the action that we taken is we tamponade, balloon tamponade across the perforated segment. We crossed by the 3020 millimeter balloon. And fortunately, after ballooning, balloon tamponade sealing of the perforation was complete. But not clearly here by this DSA. There is a dissection left there. However, flow was almost, we can say, symmetry flow. Radial bulk was fine, so we left it without any further treatment. So how did we treat Mrs. Fatma perforation? Radial artery perforation was before the diagnostic angio. We insisted to complete the angio from the radial approach step. We crossed the radial artery perforation by BCA wire and completed angiography. Still radial artery perforation for more one hour. And the uh, gas catheter didn't or failed to act as, as a hemostatic device. The lone tamponade was fine and it sealed the perforation. And the remaining non flow limiting dissection is not an issue at all. So, this was written in the literature. I would like to present this case as well. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Joha, 64, uh, short obese lady. Uh, non invasive investigations prove the evidence of ischemic heart disease. So, it's straightforward before uh, BCI. Uh, right radial approach as well. Notice there is a tight proximal mid uh, segment lesion and one immediately after this large diagonal branch. RCA was free of significant disease. Uh, two uh, drug eluting stents uh, deployed with, uh, I think, satisfactory final result. Before removing the catheter, the guide catheter, or immediately after removing, the patient felt agonizing pain in the forearm. And we noticed, I noticed by myself, progressively increasing the swelling was. Uh, like a balloon, you are inflating a balloon. So what is, what is this? It's a severe, huge perforation. So what to do? Straight uh, away, we introduced the BCA wire. Uh, we spent it three times. Unfortunately, the perforation didn't seal. So the second result in our hand was the balloon tamponading. We did balloon tamponading, okay, three times failed. We, in this case, despite we gave uh, or we offered the patient a food drug eluting stent, we neutralized heparin by vitamin sulfate. But unfortunately, unfortunately, bleeding persists. So what to do next? So shall we ask for surgical fasciotomy as Dr. Samir mentioned right now or advised? Yes, we did. But unfortunately, our team was busy, was not immediately feasible. And to be frank with you, uh, that the discontinuation and the central thrombosis was a great issue. So as a team, we did agree to do a novel technique. What is this novel technique during that time? We deployed the first ever mentioned in literature uh, coronary cover stent that fortunately healed the perforation completely and the patient did very well. Unfortunately, the patient developed this grade four uh, hematoma, which is uh, fortunately there is no evidence of uh, compartment syndrome as there was no pain, no pallor, no paresthesia, no paralysis or bulkless, five Ps that you have to remember for any patient who develops hematoma. Uh, Doctor scan was actually very, very nice to us, very assuring of uh, no further interstitial hematoma and wide vacancy of the radial artery after uh, covered stent. Uh, next day, the patient is discharged and returned back four weeks. The patient limb was absolutely healed during the time the patient was entering. I followed this patient or I, we published this patient in our center and radial artery perforation after coronary intervention. This was the first case to be published in literature followed by many publication from colleagues with similar uh, results or similar outcome. Because of its clinical value, the case granted one of the best uh, challenging cases awarded in the TCT 2010. 
and based on our cumulative experience in radial perforation, complicating transradial intervention, we propose our stepwise management. And I think many centers are taking this as a rule for the uh, standard for that. Uh, five years later, same patient came with recurrence of chest pain. And in this time, I used the ulnar approach. This is the covered stent, and fortunately, the covered stent was patent so after five years. Uh, lastly, but not least, I think it's a very interesting case as well, if time allows. Okay, this is the uh, female, 58, uh, Egyptian, morbidly obese. I think she's was more than 150 kilograms. Hypertensive and presented with high risk features of non astigmatic elevation myocardial infarction. In fable, the patient, despite optimal medical therapy, she was having ongoing uh, chest pain. ECG was horrible as well, but I think there is no time to preserve. So we did uh, from the right radial approach. Uh, LED was intermediate region in the mid segment, okay, whether it was significant or not, I think uh, was not. But anyhow, it gave very good collateral to RCA. RCA showed evidence of high risk or high grade lesion in the proximal RCA. I think it was the target or the culprit there. So we prepared for uh, BCI to RCA, but we encountered a resistance in the, for, in the art, actually. So selective injection from the uh, catheter, we identified very long, intense stas, high radial takeoff with perforation. You see this perforation, the huge breast shadow hides the perforation, it will be seen. Okay, this is a perforation. I think it will be clear after that. So right now, we have two major issues. I have a radial artery perforation. I'm going to chest pain to due to uh, high grade RCA lesion. So sh what, what shall we do? Shall we postpone? I think the answer is not. I think we have to protect this patient. We have to protect her limb and we have to protect her heart or her body as well. BCI is a must for this patient and shouldn't be postponed. So if we will proceed, so from where? I think the right answer is from the right radial approach. So meticulously a wire tried to cross the uh, spastic region but failed. So we used the balloon assisted tracking and I, as I promised, we will discuss this technique inshallah in details in the technique uh, session inshallah. So anyhow, balloon assisted tracking uh, took us to the uh, healthy segment that documented the integrity of the proximal uh, vascular anatomy or the proximal uh, subclavian, axillary and subclavian. After that, we uh, guide, uh, got the right pulse uh, wire crosses the lesion. BCI done with satisfactory final result. Uh, so what happened after that? I did expect that the uh, perforation will cease, but unfortunately, perforation persists. So what next? For three times, we crossed the lesion and uh, put the uh, catheter uh, proximal segment, unfortunately, didn't cease. So what next? Balloon tamponading, I think you now you know the answer. Balloon tamponading done three times as well, but failed. Okay, so this is a balloon tamponading. Okay, failed to seal perforation. So what next? Perforation persisted. Okay, after balloon tamponading three times. So I think the, sec is the third step is cover the stent. Okay, so after catheter failure three times and the balloon tamponading three times, unfortunately, Covered the stent, appropriate size was not available. What shall I do? Surgical fasciotomy, just remember, we deployed one of the drug, one drug leading stent. Cared about the uh, stent from post. So what I did, handmade covered the stent. The feasible solution was an on the spot creation of a handmade covered the stent. Uh, this is the handmade covered the stent, okay. We are adjusting the cover, handmade cover stent. We are inflating at high pressure. Fortunately, the perforation ceased. I kept the sheets for five hours in the patient, and I brought the patient back to the cath lab. Uh, I think the stent was uh, patent with uh, no evidence of perforation. And the most importantly, we maintain the patency of the radial uh, flow. Uh, so, uh, handmade covered stent. This is the first case to be reported to see the radial artery perforation in literature. But 
I would like to say, few cases, few case reports to seal type two coronary artery perforation, not radial artery perforation. Okay, so it is not my child uh, brain, not my idea. Successful treatment of coronary artery perforation with the handmade covered stent. Handmade covered coronary stent seals type three perforation. Whenever the ready-made covered stent is unavailable. Also, this uh, handmade covered stent used in, in, in uh, pediatric use. Also used in Japan, okay, to treat coarticulation. What are the details? I think we can uh, discuss later. Anyhow, however, however, the new design that I created right now carries many nice features. One of the most important one is it's more practical. It is easy to do and easy to advance as compared to the bulky one that we have right now. Second, the issue is more suitable to seal coronary artery perforation rather than radial artery perforation because it will, inshallah, uh, keep the, uh, the, the, sorry, the uh, branch, side branches open. So I think this is a new design, keeps the side branches open as much as we can. And I do expect that if we will manufacture, it will be associated with this ISR. Uh, finally, also this is, a, my, I, my, I, this is my proposal, uh, proposed algorithm. It is not yet published to treat radial artery perforation. Once you feel or you document radial artery perforation, please, uh, you have to document it. Okay, so place the catheter inside or proximal to the perforation. If sealed, please observe the hand. You can do a duplex scan to, uh, to ensure the patency of the radial artery and the no more hematoma. If this catheter failed to seal the perforation, so we can use balloon tamponading. If sealed, will and good observe the, or observe the radial artery perforation. If failed, I think the last resort we have right now is the cover descent and observe. I think because of the time, I have many slides as well, but I think we can stop here. Uh, we can continue uh, just to save time. This is the approach and this is the mechanism. Uh, catheter itself will act as a hemostatic device, balloon tamponading, cover descent. Thank you so much. Shukra, uh, Dr. Mansour, leave share screen, please. Okay. Uh, it was very interesting, Mansour, but like in fee, uh, two uh, small, uh, short questions. Mm -hmm. uh, balloon, Tamponading. Have you looked at the screen? Yeah, I am there. Mm. Leave the screen now. Leave, leave the screen a month ago. Okay. <clears throat> hmm. Your question about the balloon tamponading. Ah, but since I leave the screen in the hour. Well, it's okay there. I just I will bring you the uh, balloon uh, tamponading. لا ما هو انا مش عايزه انا هسال بس سؤال اسك بليز فور فور هاو لونج ديد يو كيب ذا بالون انفليتد تو سيل ذا بيرفوريشن ابروكسيمتلي 20 مينتس ات لو بريشر سايز 1 تو 1 تو ذا ارتري سو اف يو هاف 2.5 ابروكسيمتلي سو يو كان يوز 2.5 بالون 3 يو كان 3 يوز 3 او تو بي ادجستد سنترد ات ذا بيرفوريشن At low pressure. Tell us how the screen. The up to you. Feel free because if you any audience ask, I can present the screen itself. So up to you. Feel free. Oh, I think if 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 you leave the the screen, so the people will be familiar. And you have mentioned handmade covered stents. Hmm. What do you mean by handmade covered stents? Handmade covered stent, whenever the uh, ready-made or company-made uh, uh, stent is not available, so you can you manu manufacture one immediately. Uh, how did I do? Uh, how did I do? Please, I didn't uh, publish this uh, paper yet, and uh, I have uh, some intellectual right, uh, because it is, it is different than uh, previously mentioned in literature, handmade stent. So please... Okay. Uh, uh, I will receive the uh, intellectual right soon, inshallah. I will publish it and I will definitely, I will publicize to the oh, okay. uh, everyone. That's good. But it was a very nice, was very nice experience. It was very nice design. 
Okay, and as I told you, the main feature is I will keep side branches open and minimal ISR, inshallah, will be expected as compared to the old one. And the old one will be one of the past stents, inshallah, or stent from the past. Inshallah. Uh, Dr. Hatim Khalif, based on some times, uh, the diagnostic catheter cannot be advanced over the wire, possibly due to a spasm. What can I do? Okay, uh, I think the balloon assist tracking that we uh, demonstrated right now acts in almost uh, almost all patients. It didn't feel once with me in the presence of spasm, in the presence of tortuous. And the uh, last session, if you remember, I used it in uh, uh, loop, radial loop. Okay, B balloon assisted uh, before. Uh, injection of vasodilators or after failure of uh, the vasodilators? Uh, radial artery spasm, the routine radial artery spasm in a normal radial artery, usually it responds to the uh, extra doses of vasodilator cocktail. But okay. from my experience, the high tick of radial artery, when it gets in spasm, usually it resists uh, the extra doses of vasodilator cocktail. So I think we can use the assist, uh, balloon assist tracking from the beginning. I understand now that start with a vasodilator, a failed balloon assisted. Uh, am I right? 100% right. You are almost okay. always right, my bro. Okay. Dr. Uh, I think uh, I've, I've learned a lot, uh, Mansoor. Uh, yani your first case showed the perforation. Yani it was very diffuse and not very clear where the perforation is. And that answers one of the questions that was asked today. Uh, can you use the ultrasound to uh, do compression uh, of the perforation? And you clearly showed in the first case, it was very diffuse. The ultrasound is not gonna be helpful. Uh, for your second case, your uh, dissection, and you rightly said it is, uh, يعني, it has no consequences. And the reason is for uh, our junior staff is your dissection is, actually retrograde so the flow in the uh, you're, you're going retrograde and your dissection is going to be retrograde your flow is going to be anti-grade and therefore it will seal the perforation anyway um, right, 100%. Plus, yes and plus you've showed us in the uh, previous uh, lectures that even if the perforation causes uh, occlusion of the vessel of course you do not want that you have enough collateral uh, circulation that you are not worried about hand ischemia exactly. um, in your third case, there was a question about somebody was asking about neutralizing heparin, and you clearly showed that you could easily neutralize heparin if the patient has already been treated with a dual antiplatelet prior to a PCI. Uh, and I think the risk, there is a small study showing that there was no excess stent thrombosis when the heparin was neutralized immediately post uh, PCI as a protocol. Right. Okay? We don't use it, but uh, if you have to use it because of a perforation, I think it is an option. Yes. And uh, you, of course, you showed nicely the covered stent. Um, one, one question I have is uh, when you do the balloon tamponade, you're putting pressure on from the inside. Do you put pressure from the outside? So you do balloon tamponading and then you, for example, wrap something around or oh, the blood pressure cuff from the outside? No, I think it is enough to uh, recanalize the vessel from inside, endoluminal, uh, because uh, we don't expect how much pressure will reach to this uh, perforated segment. But from our experience, uh, this is more than enough, or more, uh, enough in vast majority of situations. Vast majority of situation will uh, seal, perforation seals by just uh, placing the catheter inside. And also, a failed tamponading, usually it is enough by itself. No need at all to pressurize from outside. No, no, I, I, I understand that. Most cases will, but uh, yeah. the ones you showed us did not. The yeah, case number yeah. two and number three mm. did not. Yeah. So yeah. would you add external compression after the first tamponade fails? The no, 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 usually I don't need it at all. Usually I don't do. Usually endovascular uh, reconstruction. I think this is a way to reconstruct. External okay. compression, I think, it may result in uh, radial artery occlusion, but exactly as you said, without balloon. 
you know, without if there is a balloon, we don't expect. I didn't try this to do post compression from outside and inside. I didn't do. Uh, but I think in vast majority of situation, it is usually it seals. Prof. Alam. Dr. Abdul Al, بيسأل وأظن الإجابة تعملت السؤال بتاعك الجواب عليه. دكتور محمود أبو سيرة بيسأل هل الطرق management of radial perforation is applicable to uh, for ulnar uh, perforation as well? Yes, I think the same route. It is the same route. Uh, same Dr. Abdul Maqsud, the last question from Abdul Maqsud. How to prevent or minimize the perforation during a catheter? I think it's very, very nice. And uh, as, I, as I promised, okay, everything will be discussed in the technical issue. But from mm. the beginning, okay, I think uh, the nice option that we mentioned by Dr. Banshuli right now and the wire, the way to advance and the curve itself, I think we should uh, apply. Uh, one of the most important issue is, please, please, don't push against the resistance. Don't push against the resistance, fundamental basics in intervention. I think uh, the third case that we uh, did, that there was a resistance uh, during advancement of the get catheter that uh, catheter can be <clears throat> advanced with a little resistance. I think this was the false during that time. So the first issue is the wire, don't push against the resistance, and we have to have very low threshold if you encounter any resistance to visualize the forearm and geography from the side port of the uh, reduction. And uh, let me add, let me add, yeah, Mansour, uh, three main points uh, uh, everyone should take care of if he wants to go intravascular from any side, from any axis. First of all, don't push against the resistance. Second, don't push unless you see where you are. The tip of the guide wire should be observed from the insertion point till it reaches the target or the destination and the aortic root. The third advice, never pull a catheter without seeing the guide wire protruding from the tip of the catheter to ensure that the curve of the left Jatkins or right Jatkins is straightened by the guide wire. These three points are very, very essential points to avoid a lot of complications. Uh, do you agree, Ad? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think one of the things that, uh, I mean, you, you can be very experienced uh, and you do your intervention, but we forget that we are, we are assisted by nurses who change. And if you get a new nurse, and you don't, uh, yani one of the first things I teach the, the nurses in the cath lab is that, please, when you push, it's not like when you're pushing for femoral, you, the femoral is already six to eight millimeter wide. They push the wire quickly because they're used to uh, working quickly. And then they come to your lab and you are radial and they push the same way they push in the femoral. That cannot, that is not the way. Uh, I tell them you push very, you push slowly and softly. Because if you have any resistance, you need to tell me so that I can fluoro and see what is happening, why the, there's a resistance. And that is one of the main things you have to teach the junior nurses to, pre to prevent uh, complications. I have seen some operators are pushing without notching where they are. And they are waiting in the subclavian area up in the thorax to see the guide wire reaching there. This is a great mistake. You have to monitor and you have to screen and you have to look at the tip of the, your guide wire moving through the vascular axis to be sure that you are in the right way. There is no kink, there is no sideways and you are in the proper uh, position. Uh, I, we have uh, spent one and a half hour now. Uh, would you like to add anything added or uh, to finish at this point. No, I think uh, uh, excellent uh, cases. We saw this uh, very horrible uh, uh, picture of uh, 
of uh, compartment syndrome, I think uh, whoever is doing radial uh, intervention should keep that picture in mind so that we never have to deal with it. Alhamdulillah, I've never seen one yet. So it uh, looks like it is not that common. Uh, and we got very good uh, stepwise approach, very clear minded yani, approach from Prof Mansoor. I think you should look at his paper uh, that was, he, he published and it shows the stepwise. I think it is, uh, it's a very good paper to read. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to join uh, uh, this course and see my friends again. Shukran. Uh, uh, Dr. Panchuli has left. لكن أنا جنب واحد بقى بيقول أنا كل ما أجي أقدم ناحية الريديال خطوة أشوف الكومبليكيشنز اللي منصور بيعرضها أرجع لورا خطوتين لكن uh, please uh, if you follow the rules if you follow the rules you can do everything safely uh, there are a lot of complications in the radial there are a lot of complications in the femoral the basics should be followed if you follow the basics of everything, you will do your task safely, nicely, satisfactorily, and you will feel happy. Uh, we are very happy that we have seen you today, Dr. Adil, and we will be waiting for the situation that you have no complications like Mansour. And we are happy with all the friends who have shared us today, and we will see you in the next week. واطيب تمنياتي لكم جميعا باسبوع سعيد لحد ما نلتقي الاسبوع القادم ان شاء الله. السلام عليكم. وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته. سعدنا بكم دكتور سامح، سعدنا بك دكتور عادل وسلامي ربنا يخليك يا مصور العماني. ربنا يجعل لكم ميزان حسناتك يا مصور. بس عادل كان مشارك معايا في الحالات في معظم الحالات دي كلها. اما عمال يضحك وهو مش راضي يتكلم يا منصور <تصفيق> السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته مع السلامه الله يسلمك مع السلامه مع السلامه